Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to part four of our study of the second book of the Bible, the Exodus. <clears throat> and uh, shall we begin and uh, call upon the Lord to bless this gathering? <clears throat> Thank you, Abba, for the time that you've given us uh, to come together and to explore your word and see the things that you've left there that we might fellowship in what you have to show us. <clears throat> we ask that your spirit open our minds and our hearts to the things that we'll see this morning, that they'll become a source of blessing and challenge, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Exodus part four. <clears throat> we left off the last session with the doubting Moses commissioned by God to return to Egypt and deliver the children of Israel out of bondage. Fully understanding his limitations and the size and the complexity of the task he was being called to accomplish, Moses was humbled into a place where his only alternative was to trust that God would be with him in all that he was being called to do. He would come to understand what Paul would say many years later, for when I am weak, that I am strong. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 4 and verse 18. <clears throat> Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey, and he went back to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the staff of God in his hand. <clears throat> the, the deceased king is Tutmos III, and he's the pharaoh of the oppression, of the oppression who was followed on the throne by Amenhotep II, the pharaoh of the Exodus. The Lord said, go back to Egypt. And Moses asked Jethro for permission to return to his people in Egypt because he was concerned for their welfare. And Jethro granted him leave with his blessings. The Lord had revealed to Moses that his 40-year soldier in Midian, those who had sought his life, were dead, so he needed to have no fear of reprisal. He took with him his wife Zipporah and sons. His first son was Gershom, and his second son was Eliezer, who is named later in chapter 18, verse 4. It isn't clear when Eliezer was born. But Acts 7 tells us both were born in Midian. And Acts 7.29 says Moses fled, came, became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. <clears throat> I know you're probably asking yourself, could all these fit on one donkey? Yes, donkey is singular in Hebrew. Possibly it's a scribal error and more than one donkey with use. <clears throat> donkeys are tough animals, but three people might be a bit much on one donkey. If only one donkey was used, it's assumed that the two boys, Gershop and Eliezer, <clears throat> were very young, with El Eliezer yet a babe in arms, having been born soon after Gershop. The fact that one of the boys, <clears throat> who was not mentioned, but probably Eliezer, needed to be circumcised, which was required on the eighth day after birth, does support the possibility that he was a newborn. If so, then the three could easily ride on one donkey. Verse 21. <clears throat> and the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go 
that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. <clears throat> then God told Moses about his future ministry before the Pharaoh. And Moses would demonstrate God's power to Amenhotep II. But God said it would be of no avail because he would harden Pharaoh's heart and he would refuse to let the people of God go. All right, we've got to deal with these hard hearts. <clears throat> On numerous occasions in Exodus, God is said to have hardened Pharaoh's heart. And the Hebrew word is kosak which means to harden, make rigid, or strengthen. To some people, God's hardening seems to preclude Pharaoh's exercise of his own will. <clears throat> but it is also said that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. <clears throat> and sometimes it said he's unyielding, became hard, was hard, hardened, was hard. There's several passages in there that speak to this. <clears throat> And then in Exodus 13, 15, we have the Hebrew word kosha, which is translated stubbornly refused, which is yet another Hebrew word meaning to harden. The two references to God hardening Pharaoh's heart uh, in 421 and 7.3 are actually predictions that he would do it in the future. Then in the next seven references, the Pharaoh is said to have hardened his own heart. And that was before God said to have hardened it. God's first hardening came after the sixth plague. Pharaoh hardened his own heart six times by his refusals. And then later he hardened it again in response to the seventh plague. And God hardened his heart after each of the plagues. <clears throat> Another way to look at the idea of God hardening Pharaoh's heart is to see God's actions as like sunshine. The shining sun will melt a block of butter left exposed to it. Expose it, a block of modeling clay to that same shining sun, and the clay turns to stone. The same sun had two different effects that depended upon the object and how it reacted to the sun. God's message can be received with a receptive heart, or the same message can be resisted with a hardened heart. Pharaoh will resist God's message with a hardened heart. Thus, it is said the message, in this case, a call to release the Israelites from bondage, was not received well by Pharaoh. The more he heard that call, the more obstinately he reacted to it, like the clay. That is, until the plagues finally broke it. Since Pharaoh's heart would remain callous, it's ultimately necessary to compel him by the last of the plagues, and that was the death of the firstborn. Another factor in God's hardening of Pharaoh's heart is that it was a reversal of an Egyptian belief. Egyptians believed that when a person died, his heart was weighed in the hall of judgment. If one's heart was heavy with sin, that person was judged. A stone beetle scarab was placed on the heart of the deceased person to suppress his natural tendency to confess sin, which would subject him to judgment. This hardening of the heart by the scarab would result in salvation for the deceased, according to this Egyptian belief. However, God reversed this process in Pharaoh's case. Instead of his heart being suppressed so that he was silent about his sin and thus delivered, his heart became hardened. He confessed his sin, as we shall see in some coming passages. His sinfully heavy heart resulted in judgment. For the Egyptians, hardening of the heart resulted in silence, the absence or confession of sin, and therefore salvation. But God's hardening of Pharaoh's heart resulted in acknowledgement of sin and the judgment that followed. 424. <clears throat> At a lodging place, 
On the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Zephora took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then that she said, a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. All right. This is kind of bizarre. Suddenly we come to this passage where Moses, or God is about to kill Moses. <clears throat> the designated leader of God's people had neglected to circumcise his youngest son. God disciplined Moses through a deathly sickness to remind him of his obligations. The leader must first set things straight in his own household. And this narrative contains a warning for every Israelite. Even the great prophet Moses could not get by with failing to circumcise his son. Although God had assured him that he would deliver the Israelites out of Egypt because of his covenant with Abraham, Moses had failed to circumcise his own son as required by God under that very same covenant. The incident serves as a reminder of the danger of failing to take God seriously. Circumcision is a badge and a seal of God's covenant with Abraham that was designed to teach the Israelites to have no confidence in the flesh. The flesh was to be cut away, and each Israelite was to put his faith in God. That for almost all of his life, he had not identified as a Hebrew, but mainly as an Egyptian. His one moment of identification as a Hebrew had resulted in him killing an Egyptian and having to escape from Egypt with his life. Seeing her husband so sick and near death that he was unable to do it himself and understanding somehow the cause, Zippor grabbed the flint knife and circumcised her son. Zipporah's act of touching Moses' feet with the bloody foreskin, the King James says, cast it at his feet, <clears throat> suggests her dis disdain for the practice. That plus her statement in verses 25 and 26, where she calls him a bridegroom of blood, suggests she might have thought it was a foolish and bloody thing to do. Zipporah had resisted the ordinance, and Moses had not stood up to his wife. There is a real danger when a husband and a wife do not agree on spiritual matters. That's the reason Scripture warns against believers and non-believers getting married. Moses' sudden illness was a warning that he must obey God wholly to fulfill his mission. <clears throat> At this time, Zipporah and the sons may have returned to Jethro as noted in Exodus 18, 2 through 3, where it says, Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home, along with her two sons. The reason is not stated. It probably has to do with the disagreement over the circumcision incident. Exodus 4, 27. <clears throat> and the Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all of the words of the Lord, which he had sent him to speak, and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all of the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people, and the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. So Aaron is told to go into the wilderness, which is the Sinai, <clears throat> and meet Moses. And they met on Mount Sinai, or the mountain of God, as it's sometimes called, where Moses had seen the burning bush. And Moses briefed Aaron on their mission and all that Aaron was to say. 
<clears throat> then they gathered the elders of Israel and explained it all to them. And contrary to what he expected, Moses received a favorable welcome. Despite Moses' previous doubt that the Israelites would believe him, they were excited that the Lord had seen their affliction and bowed their heads and worshipped him. Chapter 5 and verse 1. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. <clears throat> then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that may, we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. <clears throat> This must have been a pretty dramatic meeting. As emissaries of God, Moses and Aaron, both in her 80s, confidently faced Pharaoh Amenhotep II, whom the people considered a god. <clears throat> they went before Pharaoh and asked for permission for the Israelites to go into the wilderness to worship. And they claimed the Lord told them to do so. And thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go. And they suggested the Lord might discipline them if they did not do as he said. And as expected, Amenhotep II replied that he didn't know this Lord they speak of, and who is this Lord that the great Amenhotep II should listen to him? Pharaoh does not know the Lord, but he is about to become well acquainted with him. <clears throat> And so the contest begins. We should understand that this is actually a battle between God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the gods of Egypt. Each of the ten plagues to come will be directed at a specific God of the, Egypt, the Egyptians' worship, as Yahweh demonstrates his superiority over the idols. <clears throat> Uh, let's take a brief look at the ten plagues. We'll see them in more detail later. <clears throat> there are literally thousands of temples, millions of idols, and about 3,000 gods in Egypt. There was satanic power in Egyptians' religions. Satan granted power to those who worshipped him. God directed his plagues against the idolatry of Egypt against Pharaoh, and against Satan. It was a battle of the gods. God exposed the gods of Israel, Egypt as false and revealed to Israel his power and ability to deliver them. These Israelites were born in the brickyards in the midst of idolatry, and God had to show them that he was superior. <laughs> a brief outline of each plague probably going to be helpful here to show that there was some rhyme or reason to them. And when Moses first stood before Pharaoh, he changed his rod into a serpent, and the wise men of Egypt performed the same miracle. This reveals that Satan has a definite power of his own. After this came the ten plagues. The first plague, water turned to blood. The fertility of the land of Egypt depended upon the overflow of the Nile River to bring both rich soils and water. Thus, the river was sacred to the god Osiris, whose all-seeing eye was found in many Egyptian paintings. Pagan rites were held every spring when the river brought life out of death. When the water was turned to blood, it brought death out of life. And the wise men of Egypt imitated this with their sorcery. The second, the plague of the frogs. One of the most beautiful temples in Egypt was the one dedicated to Hika, the ugly frog-headed goddess. 
It was an offense to kill the sacred fog. But if you found them in your house, in your bed, in your food, and everywhere, as the Egyptians did, you might consider killing them. The wise men of Egypt also duplicated this plague. <clears throat> the plague of life. Egyptians worshipped the earth god Gib, but the dust of the land became lice throughout the land of Egypt. Thus, that which was sacred to Egyptians became despised. The sorcerers <clears throat> could not reproduce this pestilence. This was an indication that the one who brought this plague was superior to the gods of Egypt. And then we had the plagues of flies. It's thought that some of these swarms of flies were actually masses of the sacred beetle. Kipara was the beetle god. And the beetle or the scarab was found painted on the walls of Egyptian tombs and speaks of eternal life. These beetles were sacred to the sun god Ra. And then we had the plague of the murrain. The murrain is an epidemic that's limited to sheep and cattle, although the term is sometimes used to refer generally to a plague or other outbreak of a disease. The second largest temple that Egypt ever built was in Memphis for the worship of the black bull god Apis. The plague caused the Egyptians to worship a sick cow. And then the sixth plague is the plague of boils. In order to serve in the temples, the priests of all the religions of Egypt had to be spotless with a no mark or blemish on their bodies. This plague caused a ceasing of services in the Egyptian temples because none of the priests could qualify to serve. This was the judgment on the entire system of religion in Egypt. And the second, seventh plague was of hail. And God demonstrated his power with the plague of hail over the sky goddess who was powerless in her own domain. The eighth plague was of locusts. And this plague of locusts was against the insect gods and meant that crops were cursed. And the ninth was the plague of darkness. And this was God demonstrating his superiority over Egypt's chief god, the sun god Ra. The sun disk is the most common symbol found in Egyptian ruins. The plague shows the other helplessness of Ra. And the tenth plague was the death of the firstborn. According to the religion of Egypt, the firstborn belonged to the gods of Egypt. With this plague, God took for himself what was for Egypt's gods. He was teaching Egypt who he was and that he was more powerful than the gods of Egypt and able to take what was to be theirs. He was convincing Pharaoh that he was God and more powerful than all of their gods. He was also bringing the Israelites to a place where they could be confident in his ability to deliver them and that they would recognize them as their God. This final act of judgment would free Israel from the Egyptians. We should also note that Pharaoh, Aben Hotep II, was succeeded on the throne by his son, who was not his firstborn. We know what happened to the firstborn. It's important to understand that there was a purpose in the plagues of Egypt. God challenged the gods of Egypt to a contest, and he defeated Imagine the extent of the gods and idols in Egypt at that time. Yet God, through Isaiah, predicted there would come a time when the idol would disappear from Egypt. And today, Egypt is a Muslim country that forbids idols. Every idol has disappeared, as God said it would. All right, the contest continues. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 5, verse 4. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. 
And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, you shall no longer give the people straw to bake bricks. As in the past, let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past, you shall still impose upon them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, let us go and offer sacrifice to God. Let First, he asked an arrogant question. Who is this Yahweh that I would shy should obey his voice? He had never heard of God by his name. Two, he categorically rejected the demand of Yahweh. Since he did not know Yahweh, he did not intend to release Israel. Three, he attacked Moses and Aaron, accusing them of taking his workers away from their labors. Since there were now numerous people, which was an admission of the failure of past government policies, they were a threat to the crown. And four, he issued a new directive to his taskmasters and the foremen, <clears throat> literally scribes and tallymen. No more were they to supply straw to the Israelites. Yet the daily quota of bricks was not to be diminished. As Pharaoh saw it, the Israelites were simply lazy, and they were using the proposed religious pilgrimage as an excuse for suspending the work. They were being misled by Moses. He intended to drive a wedge between the Israelite slaves and their would-be deliverer, and he was successful. Straw was used in the making of the mud bricks. It served to help the mud go further. A straw was supplied by Pharaoh, but in anger he ordered that the Israelites would henceforth have to gather their own straw. Furthermore, even with this added burden of work, the Israelites were to maintain their previous production levels, not one brick less than before. Chapter 5 and verse 10. So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourself, wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout all of the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work, your daily task, each day as when there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, why, why have you done all to your task, all your task of making bricks yesterday and yesterday as in the past? The hardness of Pharaoh's heart is evident in his actions when he set about to make the burden on the Israelites more pressing. Pharaoh's orders were carried out, but the work was so much more demanding and time-consuming that the daily quota of bricks could not be met. <clears throat> that the slaves would fail to meet their brick quotas was inevitable. As a result, the Israelites' foremen over the people were beaten by Pharaoh's slave drivers who demanded that they comply with Amenhotep II's directives. Verse 15. Then the foreman of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw was given to your servants, yet they say to us, Make bricks. And behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. But he said, You are idle. You are idle. That's why you say, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given to you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. The foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, you shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task, each day. The Israelite foreman cried out to Pharaoh about how they were being treated. They charged that it was the loss of, that the loss of production was the fault of his own people. 
because they no longer supplied straw and the Israelites had to gather their own. Pharaoh's argument seems to be that the people in bondage dream of freedom only when they have excessive free time and are allowed to idle away valuable time. To solve this problem, he told the slave masters to require the same quota of bricks with no, but no longer help the people by bringing the straw. Busy with work, they would not have time to think of going on any journeys of worship. Verse 20, they met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, the Lord, look on you and judge because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. <clears throat> this was an, an additional heavy burden on an already heavy burden. The Israelite foreman found Moses and Aaron waiting for them when they came out of the meeting, and they bitterly attacked the brothers. They called upon Yahweh to judge the two for having made the Israelites odious to Pharaoh and his servants. Far from delivering them from oppression, Moses and Aaron had given the Egyptians an excuse to kill the Israelites. You have put a sword in their hands to kill us. Verse 22, then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Moses immediately turned to the Lord in lament. He agreed with the foreman that the latest oppression of the Israelites resulted from his confrontation with Pharaoh. No deliverance had been affected by presenting God's word to Pharaoh. On the contrary, the plight of the people was worse than before. And Moses wondered why he had been sent to Pharaoh at all if it only brought trouble. Moses' query was motivated by a heavy heart, not distrust of God, though his language, you have not delivered your people at all, is a bit abrupt. Chapter 6 and verse 1. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. Moses was sorrowful because his demand for freedom, freedom ironically had increased the people's burden, not eased, eased it. So the Lord comforted and reassured his messengers. God said to Moses that he would do to Pharaoh what he would do to Pharaoh, and then he reviewed his promises to his people. God assured Moses that he would indeed deliver his people. He was arranging circumstances so that Moses would let them go and would even compel them to do so. Verse 2. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but also my name, the Lord, did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, God responded to Moses' discouragement by reminding him of four things. One, his promise. Because God's strong hand, twice mentioned, Pharaoh would not merely allow Israel to leave Egypt, he would drive them out. Two, his name. In patriarchal times, God had revealed himself as El Sadai, God Almighty, the God whose power worked in the lives of faithful men. Now he was revealing himself as Yahweh, I am the Lord, the eternal, self-existing, self-consistent God. This name he had not made known, that is, explained or clarified in the days of the patriarchs. Three, his covenant. 
God's covenant with the patriarch was that he would give them the land of Canaan where they lived as aliens. And number four, his compassion. God had taken note of the groaning of his people and he remembered his covenant. The reference to Yahweh in verse three, the Lord, <clears throat> raises an important question. Was the name Yahweh known before the time of Moses? And scholars are divided on the response to this question. Some point to the frequent use of the term in Genesis. Others suggest that the occurrences of the term in Genesis are really later additions to the text. While it's possible to demonstrate that in certain places in Genesis, the term Yahweh may have replaced an earlier divine title. This is not always possible. It is apparent, however, that other divine names, and in particular El Shaddai, God Almighty, were popular among the patriarchs. However, the statement that follows, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them, seems to suggest that this is the first instance of its use. Verse 6. Therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God, and you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. <clears throat> so God then told Moses to put aside his broken spirit and the feelings of inadequacy and return to the people. Seven times in these verses, God said, I will, thus emphasizing that he is the promise-keeping God. The I wills cluster around three promises. The promises of deliverance. So I will bring you out. I will free you. I will redeem you. Second, there is the promise of the possession of the people as his own. I will take you to be my people. And third, and the gift of the land. I will bring you into land that I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you for possession. Further, the passage begins and ends with the same declaration, I am the Lord. <clears throat> the people's deliverance would become the basis for a covenantal relationship, which re would result in their being in the land. These verses present a cameo of Israel's history from the release from Egypt to the conquest under Joshua. God's redeeming them with an outstretched arm meant that his power would be evident. And the uplifted hand was a gesture used when making an oath, and it still is today. Moses' sagging spirit was again buttressed by the revelation of God's character and his purpose. Verse 9. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So the Lord said to Moses, go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But Moses said to the Lord, behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am an un of uncircumcised lips. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about the Pharaoh king of Egypt to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. So Moses obeyed the Lord and delivered the message. And the discouragement of the Israelites, however, was so great that they would not listen to the words he spoke. Again, God told Moses to go to Pharaoh, tell him to release the Israelites. And Moses hesitated. His zeal was dampened by the people's response. 
since he did not have the power to influence his own people, how could he persuade Pharaoh? He must have thought that his lack of success with the people was caused by his lack of rhetorical ability, where he says, I'm of uncircumcised lips, that is, morally unclean and incapable. This objection was answered by the Lord's command, and he gave him a charge, this time to both Moses and Aram, to go and lead the people out of Egypt. And that's where we'll conclude for today. And again, does anyone have any thoughts or questions they'd like to throw out? None? Not even I, Dave? I would, I'd just like to thank you for the clarity of verse 24. Uh, that was really confusing when I read it. I read it over many times and I really didn't quite understand it. So uh, I appreciate that. Verse 44, hardening of the heart you refer to? No, uh, of uh, verse of uh, chapter 5. He was going to kill Moses. and they were, Moses got sick and they circumcised his son. And that just, it seemed to pop out of nowhere. He's in yeah. the wilderness and all of a sudden you have this story. It's disturbing to the narrative, you're right. And it's, there's not much details given. Right. <laughs> Lane. Yes, Collins. Uh, it appears that in the way this is written, that the original purpose uh, that was given to Moses was to have Pharaoh permit only a brief departure for the sole purpose of worshiping God on Mount Sinai, it the way the scriptures are uh, written, it does it Im, does not imply uh, initially that the purpose was for the Israelites to be set free completely, to be permitted to, if you will, to go to take possession of the land of the uh, Canaanites. Am I misreading that or? No, you're not. You... And it's kind of a strange point that you're making. You're, you're absolutely right. The There was no mention made of um, them not coming back. And the commentary that I read on it uh, was silent on that point, other than to point out that there was no mention made. Um, and I don't know what to make of it myself. Uh, was God just was he being deceptive and that's kind of a charge that you don't want to be, make, be making against God um, but it's that's what it looks like getting back to his question uh, the way I took that because I had the same question and I kind of pondered it I think God designed it to say three days to force Pharaoh for the hardening of the slavery. Because if they would have gone to Pharaoh and said, we want you to release our people, they want to leave. That's different than going out for three days and coming back and working. So he looked at it as really Pharaoh saying, you have slack time, you have idle time. So that request from Moses actually hardened Pharaoh's heart against them rather than did anything by, about releasing them to go back to their promised land. So I think it was designed by God, and it's a point that he designed it so that Pharaoh said, you are idle, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force you harder labor, and the people will be, I think, more yes, so do, so do. gracious and that they got released from Egypt because they were forced with harder and harder labor. So I, I look at it, it, it's probably, it's planned and it's designed, but it is confusing when it's almost like Moses was deceitful in what he was telling Pharaoh. And maybe that's the case. And maybe it led to more harsh treatment because he was deceitful. He wasn't doing what God instructed him to do. I don't know, but just my view. Well, that's an inter interesting point. And one of the things that we, 
observe in this whole process from beginning to look, people leaving Egypt is that there is a ratcheting up of the um, the threats and the, um, the the demands and the minimal demand may have been let my people go knowing that he was not going to do that you know, let my people go for a three-day feast in the desert knowing that he wasn't going to do that and that's ratcheted up to the next level and that's just part of the plan yeah but Lane I kind of saw it uh, from a more of a future application perspective, especially when they say, let me go three days journey. And, but they did mention Mount Sinai. So you're looking at taking it personal back to when we were first born again, we still have this law in the flesh and you know you're going to receive the law eventually at Mount Sinai. And the only deliverance you get from that is you have to see the cross, which is the three days, you know, buried and risen again, you know, all of that picture. Mm -hmm. But through our first coming to God, you know, we get beat up a lot from the pulpit about the law. You know how we say it? Oh, we took the Ten Commandments out of uh, <laughs> out of this. We took it out of that. And I said, wait a minute, hold up. Uh, we couldn't even meet the Ten Commandments to begin with. <laughs> so why is that a real problem? <laughs> but when you apply the law of the spirit of life, now you get the whole freedom of living by that law. And it is a lifelong fight of uh, one is intimate against the other. So I think it's more like a, a allegory you know, as life application, not as a theological thing, but I'm thinking it, you know, in that way. That's a good point. Lane, what country or what area uh, did the Israelites live in before they uh, basically went south to uh, Egypt to avoid the starvation? Um, they lived up around Hebron, which is near uh, south of Jerusalem, if I'm remembering my map correctly. That's where Abraham and the family lived. Is that the question you're asking? Yes, and is that the, quote, land of the Canaanites where God uh, is saying to Moses uh, he's going to give them if they you know go is that the land of the canaanites yeah or is that a different area and a couple of passages we studied i think last week or the week before it described the different tribes that were occupying this area that is collectively called canaan um i guess all those tribes are, are called or are, are kind of captured under that uh that word canaan or canaanites but they were the parasites and different other sites, um, they, the living tribe living in an area. They weren't the Israelites, though, were they? Were they Hebrews? Those no, the, the Hebrews were um, uh, isolated to those of the family of Abraham. I, what did the Canaanites have to uh, say about? Uh, their land basically being given by God to the Hebrews. Well, we had a war. <laughs> yeah. come with, uh, later when they go into the land. But uh, God tells the uh, Israelites to wipe them out, remove them all, which they did not do, and they paid a price for that later in their history. But the Canaanites were just an awful bunch of idolaters like the Egyptians. And God had had his fill of them, and he was prepared to eradicate them and give the land to his people, or those who would worship him, rather than those who would worship idols. And this is one of the reasons why Israel later slips into idolatry itself, and God says, out, kicks them out of the land, and sends them into... Uh, 
Uh, what I'm looking for. Exile. Anybody else? Okay. Let's close with prayer. Thank you again, Abba, for the privilege that you give us to come together and to study your word. Thank you for your blessing upon this meeting and for your blessing upon each of us. We ask that you bless us as we go through this uh, coming week and that we might recall to our minds the things that we have seen in this class today and that um, we might meditate on these things and think about you and think about your plan and how you are redeeming what was lost by the Adam. And then we ask that you, uh, as you bring these things to mind, that they might become a source of blessing and challenge as we go through this week, as we are witnesses for you in Satan's world. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lane. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lane. Yeah, have a good week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lane. Lane, I, Lane, I have one question. Sure. Not a, <laughs> so I've been struggling with the, the idea of most people say that Abraham was an idol worshiper, right? Mainly because of his family and his heritage. It's, it's just that like the same as labeling somebody something where they show real no evidence that they actually did. Let's take the example of Rachel and Leah, right? So, yeah, we have evidence that Rachel kind of held on to idols from her father. But Leah is never mentioned about <laughs> trying to hold on the to that so mm -hmm. if we can find if if you can help me find some evidence that abraham actually <laughs> had any relationship with idols i know it says in genesis 12 where it talked about getting out of you know his father's country and all the other kind of things but personally i just can't see where there is any evidence that said he actually did well, other than, yeah, the, the scriptures does refer to him as coming out of an, um, an idol-worshipping culture. Um, and I think many expositors derive, uh, um, arrive at the conclusion that he must have been an idol worshiper before he um, God spoke to him and led him out of that environment and into the land of Canaan, ultimately. As for um, Rachel, if I'm remembering correctly, she stole her father's idols, which correct a, a threat, a uh, not a threat. I don't know where I'm looking for it. Kind of a, a vindictive act, right? To take those idols away from because they, you got to consider these guys, and you got to think in their terms. And some of you may even been exposed to this today. That when someone is into idol worship and they pray to a specific statue, for example, that uh, they'll get real upset if you mess with that idol that they're praying to. Right. Yeah. yeah. Lane, you have to be careful about uh, the. Uh, obsession with the symbol of the Ten Commandments uh, as possibly being a form of idol worship if our desire to maintain the uh, the Ten Commandments as a significant influence in our world the fight over the, quote, symbol of the Ten Commandments can be observed by uh, the 
world as a form of idolatry. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Symbolically, you're right. It can look like idol worship. You. Mm -hmm. And in reality, when you stop and think about it, I mean, that's a great point, Collins. What, do, what representation do we have of this? What do we, we build some sort of an idol with a book, an open book or something with numbers one through 10 written on them? And that becomes, in a sense, an idol. And where did God say that the law would be written after the uh, Moses broke them all? be written in our hearts that's right that's right that's not a that's not an idol you know it's that's you know it's that's, i'm not saying that we shouldn't understand and remember and 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 obey those commandments um i believe it's very important for us to remember where they are written and that they're having been written in our hearts, can't be taken away by a government or a court or an invading army or a, a, a dis, you know, a spiteful daughter that wants to snatch him away from us on her way out of town. These are here in our hearts and they are God's way of saying, not only are they my law, but they are to be yours and they are to be kept there because I'm writing them in your hearts. I think the danger, Colin, that you run into is that we're not passing these, these things down to the generations. And some of the biggest things that come about when you look at the failure of, of the Israelites is they failed to pass on God and who God was and remembrance of God to the next generation. So when you take this out of our schools and you take it out, out of the room, it, it, it's just, it was a way of remembrance. So I don't look really look at it as an idol, but anyway, it's just from my thoughts, uh, yeah, it, it's our responsibility, though they took it away, it's still in our hearts. How do we pass that down to the next generation and the next generation? Tess has her hand raised. Yes. Uh, yeah, let me make one point before we go to Tess. Yeah, I think you're right. It's not really an idol, but I, I think what Collins is saying, it could be perceived as such by people who want to criticize us as Christians. Yeah, that I agree with, yes. Huh? It becomes works. Uh, work at keeping the commandments. Janice makes a good point. It can become works as keep in keeping the commandments. Works for salvation. Okay, Tess, you've been holding up your hand. You must be losing the blood in your hand by now, huh? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm multitasking. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, you know, it's interesting listening to this conversation, and I know that what I'm going to say is probably very... I don't know, bold, that I just feel that it's a bit of discernment, is that in a secular world, I it's not just the Ten Commandments. I think the cross is a symbol that we use that the secular world has converted into an idol in many ways. And it's, it's very concerning. Um, and it just, when I see it being used, as a thing, um, it, it you know, I, I think there's many of our precious symbols in Christianity that are being used by the secular world as idols. Very true. Yeah. Well, we use these things to remind us of, to, supposedly at least, to remind us of, of a basic truth. And they're, they're not a point of worship they're a point of reminding us of what we should be worshiping. But, you know, like I said, the secular world can look at some of the things that we see that way and accuse us of being idol worshipers. All right, well, thanks again, everyone, and I'll see you next week.